You know, industrial automation is important for profitability, for throughput, and for quality. But the assumption that only high volume, low mix parts are suitable for automation, well, that just might be a myth. And I'm with John Luce here. He's automation manager for Methods Machine Tools. And John, I understand that even relatively high mix, low volume production like the medical industry are, are suitable candidates for process automation. Those are good candidates. And really the, the, the things you have to consider is just like in machining, where you're gonna do quick change vices or work holding, you're gonna do the same thing on the end of your robot. Uh, the great thing with a robot though, it's fully programmable. So to, to call up different parts, it's really just calling up a new program number. But really it's just how you outfit that robot, that in-feed system that allows you to do many different parts. Yeah, John, how about the fixturing issue? Because we all know it's in a manual loaded thing, you can have everything from an old Kurt Weiss and a guy whacking the handle down mm -hmm. to, to some uh, fairly sophisticated fixturing. But a human being can see if there's swarf or if there's a misorientation of the part in there. Mm -hmm. How do you cope with that when you automate those processes? Well, uh, our biggest problem in machining basically is when somebody touches it. The nice thing when you give it to a robot, a robot could use technologies such as vision to confirm that a part's in place. But once we know that once, all the way through the process, we're pretty certain that it's where it needs to be. Where if we have people loading it, we really need to check on each different situation and each different step to see if it's in the right position. Now the robot vendors, they often show a, a generic end effector. It's, it's a simple gripper, or it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's a jaw of some sort at this point. But you're talking about something which I think requires more engineering, something more sophisticated as mm -hmm. end of arm tooling. Mm -hmm. How difficult is that process? Uh, not, not really at all. Uh, if you're into machining, you had three jaw chucks, you have vices, and you're used to designing gripper finger, or you're used to designing chuck jaws mm -hmm. and uh, vice jaws to hold parts mm -hmm. while you're machining with high speeds and high forces. Mm -hmm. In a gripper, you're literally just picking up a part and moving it over here. You're making very similar to a set of chuck jaws uh, to do that. The technology that you're talking about is we can quick change that. The whole end of arm of the robot can be automatically changed. So now I could have four or five or ten grippers all set up with all different size gripper fingers and I just go over, pick up the new end of arm tool, pick up the new part we're running, or the second part, or the third part. So it's technologies like that that allow us to do those low volume parts effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, would you recommend pallet based systems? Is that generally where you how you automate medical applications? Well, pallet based systems now is go back to the work holding. And I I think that that's a great way. Um, there's only so many things you can do with creative with uh, a set of uh, vice jaws. But by having a replaceable pallet that the robot picks up and changes itself does a couple of things. Number one, I can put whatever work holding I want on the pallet. Mm -hmm. But number two, I can also set up the robot so I'm only picking the pallet. So instead of different programs and things, the robot is just loading a pallet. What you do with the top of the pallet is up to you. And again, that's another technology that it really allows you to do those low volume parts effectively. Now, I know that many users who are just first looking at automation tend to think of the robot as a pick and place replacement for a human operator. Mm -hmm. Straight load, straight unload there. Now, it's a lot more complex than that. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. um, and there are many, uh, the high volume, low mix type parts, really that's what the robot did, is it just loaded and unloaded. But together with technologies like inspecting the part, cleaning the part off after you machine it, mm -hmm. um, those really are enhancing kind of the usefulness of the robot and the effectiveness of the system. Now with your increasing the speed and there's less actual downtime or, or mm -hmm. non-cutting time that the robot be able to insert, remove quickly, uh, the, the done-in-one philosophy says do everything inside the machine, including mm -hmm. checking. So you've got a Renishaw Pro maybe in the mm -hmm. cassette and it's changing a tool and it's touching off a few points. Does, does this level of automation let you do some inspection outside the machine cost effectively? It does, it does. Um, to put a CMM outside the machine, a vision-based system outside the machine and bring the part and load it into that system for checking, uh, the benefit there is instead of wasting my spindle time with a spindle probe, can I check the part outside of the machine while I'm machining the next one? So no, those are great technologies to, uh, to use, especially with those pallets we talked about. You could have that same clamping system that holds the pallet also in your CMM, load the pallet right on the CMM, and now we're checking that part. John, do automation buyers actually know what they want? Are they actually, are, they, are their expectations realistic? You know, this is a uh, awkward thing to answer, but absolutely not. Um, we would traditionally come with people that have looked at trade magazines, gone to shows, and they have an idea of what they want. And I find what I do in my job is to sit together with them and say, you know, that's one way, but we could also do it this and this, and, and this is what we tend to do, and kind of try to address all those problems. So I do find they tend to not know exactly what they want, but 
I find with some good explanation, some documentation, you're really able to see kind of some of the uh, technologies that are out there and we come to an agreement on what they need. Is it possible to automate an existing, for example, 5 access machining center or is it, would you, do you prefer to automate a system that's turnkey from the ground up? Uh, I would prefer to do a brand new machine from the ground up. When I get into doing used machines and things along the lines of that, um, there are things that we don't control. Automation is great, but I've got a load of fixture. If I'm doing a used machine, I tend not to have done the fixture. So is the fixture up to snuff? A lot of people have manual fixtures and they're gonna to try to automate those manual fixtures. That's tough to do. To build a fixture from the ground up to be automated, so I can automatically load it and automatically close it. So I would prefer to do the whole thing because then the whole thing is, is on me. Um, we take responsibility for it and I can guarantee that it works from the ground up. John, an automation buyer, what's the smartest thing they can do when they first approach you? What kind of homework could a, could a smart buyer do? I think to look on YouTube, to look at the trade magazines, and to get some of those ideas. So even though those people come to me with ideas that might, I might not always think are the best, it starts the discussion. Their understanding. When I have a guy that has articles that he cut out or videos that he wants to show me, boy, this guy is doing homework. That's the best guy. I, I, I'm you know, excited as heck because I've got a guy that I can talk to. He's looking at this already. So I think YouTube, the internet, really is the best place that you can start to look at uh, for those technologies. Do your homework for automation success as John Lucier at Methods Machine Tools.